دان الله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سفن النجاة العلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك وغرق ثم أما بعد Respected elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We are continuing from where we left from yesterday and I would like to shed some light on the hadith that I started my talk about or midway and I left you in limbo because I mentioned two parts of it and I forgot the third one I actually didn't forget the third one but I wanted to see all these beautiful faces so I said let me drop the third one so I can see you today inshallah the hadith I said or I quoted is that the Prophet sallallahu said that I love from your world three things number one perfume which Muslims should really visit very often. Okay. Secondly, women. <laughs> and this is something I think we spoke about at length and today also in the women section or in the women uh, 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 lecture we spoke also at length and I've been advised that don't talk to the women anymore, speak to the men from now on so that they can also handle themselves in a way that is acceptable and accommodating to women in the sense that it is not always the woman that has to always beautify herself for her husband but the husband should also reciprocate and ornament himself for his wife in order for that love to grow and for that you know uh, uh, um, chemistry or that affinity to keep going so that the, the spark between the two couples will never go dry or will never go out or be extinguished. In fact, we are told that the Prophet ﷺ when he used to go in a battle and he would come back or in a journey, whatever the case may be, he would never come back home after the battle. He would first go to the mosque. He would sit in the mosque and if it was night time, he will sleep over in the mosque. In the morning, he will take a bath. He will apply perfume. He will put new clothes on. He will comb his hair. He will trim his beard. And then he will go and knock at the door of his wife's. So that they will not see him in a way that they are not familiar with. So that they will not see the injuries and the suffering of the travels because they are not used to seeing him in that way. But in our case, someone who's a mechanic who comes home with his greasy clothes and he says to his wife, give me a hug. How in God's name? How is that possible in your greasy smelling clothes you want to give your wife a hug or a kiss? It is not, it is insanity for this to happen because we often complain that when I want to come home I don't want to see my wife in her oniony or garlicky dress that she spent the entire day in the kitchen wearing and then she receives me at home with that kind of dress so it is a matter of reciprocal respect for the dignity and the emotions of the two parties involved in fact we are told by historians that the prophet وسلم, used to keep a comb under his pillow so that he would comb his beard and hair when he wakes up in the morning so when his wife comes to see him she will see him in the best possible countenance 
that he can be in and not you know someone he says sheikh do you use gel i said i use every sort of gel for my wife of course i do what do you think we are living in in mars we are living on earth and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed okay don't take it too much to heart that i use gel all right i'm just <laughs> so but i'm saying if it helps promote that sense of affinity and love between husband and wife then we should do it and we should always go ahead of our time in order to be in a position where we can accommodate one another 60 percent of divorce cases among the youth are due in our community are due to the fact that the men do not ornament themselves to their wives and the wives do not beautify themselves for their husband we are talking about challenges that are facing our youth on a daily basis and our men in general you know when they live in a society that is plagued with the billboard syndrome of semi-naked women and indecent dressed females this man when he comes home and he finds his wife in a pj he's not gonna get his mind off these billboard pictures in the streets and in the road because you will never see a billboard with a woman covered you will see a billboard with a woman uncovered and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whenever a man sees a woman and he desires her let him go to his wife so that this thinking of desire will be eliminated in a halal methodology and way so this is as far as woman is concerned and men is concerned the third point that the Prophet ﷺ talk about and which is often neglected in our midst and not enough attention is given to that concept that the Prophet ﷺ said and the joy of my eyes is in prayers. Prayers brothers and sisters which is the link between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali says if people knew how much blessings descends on them while they are in prayer they would not have left their forehead from sajda they will remain in sajda for so long because the prophet taught and said aqrabu ma yakunu al-abdu min rabbi wa huwa sajid the closest a person can be to his creator when he is in the post of prostration why because iblis and shaitan does not wish to see you in that position because when Allah ordained for mankind or for people at large or for the angels, beg your pardon, to prostrate before Adam, it was only Iblis who rejected. So when he sees you prostrating, he cannot bear it. And that's why Shaitan tries his level best to take you away from the medium of prayer. And he will tell you that prayer is nothing. Yet prayer is the only obligation in Islam that was not revealed on earth. When Allah wanted to tell his prophet about Rosa, he brought Jibreel down to earth. When he wanted to talk to him about the uh, uh, um, conditions of fighting, he brought Jibreel to earth. When he wanted to talk to him about women's issues, he brought Jibreel to earth every other when he wanted to speak about charity he brought Jibreel to earth but when he wanted to speak about prayer he brought Muhammad to heaven right and when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in heaven it was then that Allah said to him I'm giving you a gift which is prayer and that is prayer that is why we call prayer the ascension ladder of a mu'min mu'rajul mu'min from which you can grow towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is no medium on earth can bring you closer to Allah than the medium of prayers Allah ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad <coughs> do I have to pay you for salawat <laughs> Allah
we are told by our imams and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam that when you are in the state of prayer you must always exercise your prudence and your intelligence to feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that Imam Ali felt the presence of Allah to such an extent that he said himself, Wallah, law kushif al ghita mazdat tu yaqeena. Allahu Akbar. By God, if the curtain between us and Allah was to unveil, my certitude and belief in Allah will not increase an inch. Subhanallah. Why? Because Allah was always part and parcel of Imam Ali's existence. Wherever he went, he felt Allah. Whenever he spoke, he felt Allah. Whenever he spoke, he spoke about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is all through the medium of prayers. It is amazing when someone wants to understand the prayer of Ali ibn Abi Talib or the prayer of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the case of Amirul Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam alayhi, we are told that when that beggar came into the mosque and asked the Mu'mineen and Muslimin of the time to help him because he was a poor person and he could not sustain himself in supporting his need for eat food and drink. And we are told that it was only Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib who extended his hand to indicate to that poor person that take my ring and sell it so that you can gain some benefit from it and feed yourself. One of, of our younger communities came and asked me and he said, Sheikh, this hadith makes no sense to me. I said, why? He said, because you always tell us, and all the Mawlanas tell us, and all Maraja at Taqlid tell us, that Amir al Mu'mineen, when he's in prayer, he does not hear what's happening around him. I said, amazing point. You are such a clever human being who does not just accept anything that is said from the member. Right? But rather, we should analyze everything that is being said from the member and not take everything for face value. I'm glad that people write me emails and say, you said in khutbah number one or khutbah number two or lecture number three or lecture number four, one, two, three, four, can you please verify what you are telling us? This is intelligence. And this is not taking people's intelligence for granted or messing with people's intelligence. No, we must be at a level to think with our scholars and to think with our lecturers and to think with those who always come to teach us and not to let them think for us. Enough is enough where you find yourself sitting in a, in a, in a, in a gathering and you only there to be told what to do or to be told how to behave rather than being part and parcel of the exercise of having an interactive session where also people on the other end of the table can learn from your experiences, can learn from your thoughts, can learn from what you have read and analyzed so that we can both grow together in this evolvement of spirituality as Amir al-Mu'mineen salamullah alayh always tells us this man shawar al-nas sharakahum fi uqoolihim surely the one who asks people or consults people he will add part of their intelligence to his intelligence and how beautiful to be able to exchange our intelligence rather than to put our intelligence on the shelf and let every other being think on our behalf and that should not be the case in the case of that youngster i said yes in fact ali ibn abi talib did not respond to the call of that poor person on earth because the soul of ali ibn abi talib was not on earth when he was praying why? Because it is Rasulullah who told us that Salah is the ascension ladder of a mu'min. Yani when he's in prayer, his soul rises towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When no one responded to the call of that man, that beggar, 
that beggar turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he turned to Allah, because the soul of Ali was in neeness to the divine mercy of Allah, Ali ibn Abi Talib was able to hear the call of the beggar in heaven. And that's why he extended his hand on earth. He did not hear the call here, brothers and sisters, because Ali ibn Abi Talib's mind was not downstairs. It was way, way, way upstairs. Huh? And that's how we should be when we approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How is it possible that you are with Allah and you can think about the Nikai and the Nasdaq? How can, be, how can you be with Allah and think about the wife or the children or what's happening in the country? No, when you are with Allah, you are with Allah full stop. And you don't need to be here and there. Yes, it takes time to concentrate. Yes, it takes time to learn how to be focused in our prayers and in our concentration. But the minute you get that concentration, even if it was for a minute, and that's what the Prophet says, whosoever prays two rak'at namaz without thinking about anything in this world, Jannah is guaranteed for him. That is a merciful God that allows you to enter Jannah where everyone is fighting for it if you pray two sincere rakat for you. And God gives you 83 years, the average lifespan of a human being to what to achieve these two rakat numbers. Well, a shame on us if we can't achieve two rakat namaz in 83 years. Huh? What do we tell to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then? That we were not able to concentrate in our prayers? How meticulous are we when we are counting our millions and thousands? Do we even make a mistake? We go. Huh? Is it one or two pieces of hundred dollar note? No, it's one. Okay. Go for the next. Huh? Go for the third. Even if it's going to take me all night long. I will keep counting meticulously the notes and I can hear them tick one after another. But when it comes to the medium of prayer, Sheikh, I don't know how to concentrate. Sheikh, I have a problem concentrating. You know why you have problem concentrating? Because prayer was never, never, to most of us, something that we worry about. But we do it out of fee because we have been told, if you don't, then God help you with Fishari Qabr. Right? We've never approached Salah because I want to love the God that loves me back. Huh? I don't want to be involved in prayer because I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to be involved with me. No, I do it rather on the basis of fee. If you want to do it on the basis of fee, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is no benefit in it. What benefits you is if you are focused with me on the basis of what makes you close to me. When Bilal used to wait, waiting for the time of Adhan to happen, Rasulullah would be seated in his mosque while Bilal is standing on one of the pillars of the mosque or one of the walls of the mosque. And he would say, Rasulullah would say to Bilal, hasn't the time for prayer commenced? And Bilal said, no, Ya Rasulullah. Two minutes later, Rasulullah would ask, hasn't the time for prayer has commenced? And Bilal said, no, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Ya Bilal, please give us relief so, can, so we can enter into the medium of Salah. Let us call for prayer so that we can be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Train your children to love Salah for the sake of being with Allah, not for the sake of being afraid of what will happen as a result of neglecting Salah. Part number five of our speech for today about religion. That religion, the reason why we need religion is that it's, it is a sanction and it fights against discrimination. And let me say this and please accept it from me. There is no one as discriminate as the Muslims in the world. We are the most discriminating race under the sun. Especially when it comes to Muslims among themselves. Hmm? Especially when it comes to Muslims among themselves. 
This is مقلد of مرجع so and so. And this is مقلد of مرجع so and so. And your تقليد uh, What's it to you of his تقليد? What's it to you who he follows in terms of his تقليد? Right? And تقليد when was تقليد of a مرجع ever something that a community or an individual can judge another community or another individual on? Let the person, if he's content and he arrives at certitude in following a particular marja and he satisfies his edicts of religious practices and in his mindset he is convinced that his taqlid will be satisfactory before Allah, then his taqlid is acceptable before Allah. Don't judge him and don't say my marja is better than your marja. Wallah, the maraja themselves never said that among themselves. There is no marja that says to another marja, I'm better than you. Huh? Why is it we find it in ourselves that we bring these debates among ourselves? No, let people be convinced in whom they follow. Discrimination is something that Islam does not entertain or allow. Religion strongly opposes any form of discrimination based on color, race or class because it regards all human beings as God creatures and every country as God's country. That is why Ali ibn Abi Talib when he was asked which is the best of countries? Which is the best of countries? Is it the country I was born in? Is it the country that my parents were born in? Is it the country that I spent all my life in? And Amir al muminin comes to change the mindset of Muslims. He says to them, the best of countries are the countries that carries you and allows you to feel and experience your humanity. Allahu Akbar. So if I am in a country that I was born in and I can't feel a sense of my humanity, even if I was born in this country, this is not my country. My country is the country that provides me with services. My country is the country that respects my humanity. The country is the country that respects my rights. This is the country that I belong to. That is why wherever you go, it is Allah's land. It is no one's land. It is the land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And interestingly enough, that all maraja of taqlid are of their opinion. That if you migrate to a country, you must abide and respect the laws of that country. Huh? So you go to the west, Look at some of the questions I used to get in through emails. Shaykhuna, I live in a Western country. Okay. And the people we live with are kafir. Look at the word, huh? They are kafir. Can we lie to get social security benefits? How could you ask this question? How could you even say, can I lie? Huh? to get social benefits just because they are kafirs are they less of a human being than you that you can scheme and plot against the system simply because they are not muslims and who said that in the law of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can discriminate against anyone simply because he is not a muslim you know who said in what books in what quran in what uh, tradition of the Prophet ﷺ do we find the need to say that because he's not a Muslim then he has certain set of laws. I was in a court case once and a brother by the name of Mustafa came. And now I'm telling you truth. I'm, this is not a joke. Huh? When I want to tell you a joke, I will tell you it's a joke. This is truth. I am interpreting to this guy, Mustafa. What did this guy do? On a rainy day, he walked out of his back door, went to the fence towards his neighbor, jumped the fence, took the DVD of his neighbor, and came back home. So the police got caught up with him because fingerprints, his footprints, 
uh, because the guy was such a genius he had to steal the DVD on a rainy day right and he came back home the police got hold of him they charged him with what we call in the West goods in custody and he's stolen goods they're not yours so the ja I'm asking him I said brother between me and you I'm a Muslim and you're a Muslim like me in all honesty did you steal that DVD he said in fact yes I did I said really he said yes I said on what basis he said he's a kafir he's a kafir he said you had the audacity to go into his house I said you know what when they call your name now I kiss your hand when the judge says is Mustafa in court don't say yes say Michael is in court don't say Mustafa in honor of the name of the Prophet don't take the name of the Prophet. You are humiliating Islam with your actions. He said, Wallah, if I get charged now, tomorrow I will go and steal it again. You know why? Because these people are given fatwas by very high ranking authorities. Among some, I don't know, lunatic Maulanas that tells them that the money and the property of a non Muslim is halal to you. Well, I had well, I have been. Huh? And all of our maraja of taqlid say what? They say when you are in a country, you must always respect the law of that country. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know what he says? لَيْسَ مِنْ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ مَنْ لَمْ يَأْمَنْ جَارَهُ بَوَائِقَ no one will believe in Allah and the day of judgment if his neighbor is not safe from his action. Allah Akbar. You're not a believer in Allah and the day of judgment if your neighbor is not safe with you. If your neighbor cannot feel the security by being next to you. And it is so unfortunate that life is being wasted. 38 year old professional lawyer gets gunned down for what reason why is the blood of Muslims among themselves is so cheap when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Woman ahyaha ahya nasa jamia. whoever revives one soul it is as if he has revived and given life to the entire human race وَمَنْ أَمَاتَهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَمَاتَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا And the one who kills one soul, it is as if he has killed the entire human race. Subhanallah. And we still are at each other's throat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so kind and generous to his neighbors even when they went against him and they actually tried to be a pestering neighbors to him and they tried to mistreat him and ill treat him but he never reciprocated the ill treatment back to them because he was a model of human standards when it came to ethics so Islam says you must all Always respect what about your neighbor let alone if that neighbor happens to be what your relative the first thing you must honor about your neighbor is his dignity meaning what don't look at his wife don't wait for him to leave the home and go on the veranda good morning huh? you are so beautiful today so beautiful you think Allah is not watching you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know what you're doing to other people's wives and Allah and the Prophet promise the Prophet promise and he says whoever messes with someone else's wife in a haram way by paying a thousand of dollars Allah will make people mess with his wife without the dollar without the dollar hmm? so protect your own households by keeping away from other people's household hmm? don't go near them Re on the contrary respect them honor them 
protect them see how you can protect them and others in the process so that Allah can protect you and your families and your children and your wives in the process number two to protect his wealth not like one neighbor came to his neighbor this is a joke huh? one neighbor came to his neighbor he wanted to go to Hajj he said brother Hajj whatever Hajj X I'm going to Hajj, so I have two kilos of gold I want to entrust you with. Can you please look after us? Of course, with my eyes on top of my head. But you know what? Because we may not live, we may die, let me get my, my son, who's also a Hajj, to actually witness the transaction of you giving me the two kilos of gold. Whoa, the neighbor felt so good. How honest is this Hajji? Huh? So the young Hajj, the young ex-Hajj comes. He said, Baba, this our neighbor Abu Muhammad, father of Muhammad, he, alhamdulillah, he's going to Hajj. So he's giving me these two, two kilos of gold to entrust it for him. So be a witness that when he comes back, if I die, you give him the two kilos back. This guy went with a blindfold. Khalas, his money is secure. Gone to Hajj, came back, he came to his neighbor. Salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Mubarak your Hajj, Mubarak my Hajj. Where is my two kilos of gold? He said, what gold? He said, the gold I gave you before I went. He said, I don't know any gold. He said, huh, you brought your son to be a witness. So the father called, he said, X, come. Do you know this guy? He said, Wallah, I've never seen him in my life, Dad. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. When we are in, you know, the Prophet said about this time, there will come a time about, uh, there will come a time in my nation's time, towards the end of time, where I trust becomes a spoil of war. Yani, you know what? You think that this trust is now yours. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, when he left Medina, when he left to Medina, before he left to Medina, and for 30 years consecutively, what was the Prophet called? As-Sadiq al-Amin. The truthful, the trustworthy. It's amazing that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left to Medina, who did he leave behind? Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? Why did he leave Ali ibn Abi Talib behind? Historians record three reasons. We know that Ali ibn Abi Talib stayed back only for one reason, right? And that is to do what? To sleep in the bed of the Prophet. That's one reason. Reason number two is to bring all the ladies whose names was Fatima. Fatima bint Asad, Fatima bint Muhammad, Fatima bint Zubair, Fatima this, all the Fatimas from the household of the Prophet, it was the task of Amir al muminin to bring them. Task number three is to give back the property of non-Muslims that were kept in the house of the Prophet back to their rightful owners. Allahu Akbar. So much so that history tells us that when the Prophet left, Abu Jahl seized the opportunity to go to the sacred mosque and cry out loudly, this is Muhammad that you used to call the trustworthy. He has left Mecca and took all your properties with him. Immediately at the same time, Imam Ali, he's the call of Abu Jahl. He enters the door of Salam and he says, Whosoever has left a trust with Muhammad, let him come and claim it from me. This is Islam, brothers and sisters. Although according to the Geneva Convention, huh, when people persecute you and expel you out of your country, take whatever you can with you because you are being oppressed. According to the Geneva Convention, it says, when you come back to a country, and the people and the citizen of this country has acted in a treason way by expelling people unjustly, you have the right to persecute them. Yet when the Prophet came to Mecca, what did he do with the people of Mecca? He pardoned them. 
He said, go, you are free for the sake of Allah. Right? This is what we can learn from the Prophet when it comes to the question of entry discrimination. According to this, all enjoy God's love and kindness equally and as such all are equal before Allah. According to the teachings of Islam, no man can be superior to another man on the basis of his color, race, descent, language or class. Islam recognizes only piety as the touchstone of superiority. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Surah Hujurat in verse 13, O mankind, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. <coughs> Surely the most honorable of you in the sight of Allah is he who is most pious. Not is he who is most Muslim. Huh? Not is he who is most Shia. Not is he who is most Sunni. Not is he who is most Bahari. No. He who is most righteous. In as much as you benefit people in the world you live in, you become the most and the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the basis of your faith. Thus, the role of religion in the world is that it has not, unfortunately, thus the role of religion in a world that has not yet been able even to solve the color problem is quite clear. Those who talk about civilization, those who talk about being pioneers in civilization, up until the 1960s, we're not allowing people who were black to ride in the same bus as white people, right? And then they come and tell us that Islam is a religion of discrimination. No, if some of its members discriminate, the religion of Islam does not discriminate. So don't judge the Islam that you see today on the basis of what Muslim practice, but judge the Islam on the core principle of the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ and the teaching of the Quran. Number six, religion and individual freedom. This is something we need to understand, and especially our youngsters. Today, one of our very bright students asked me a question. She said, why do parents not give us our space? Good. You want your space? Space that you are calling for has to be earned. It cannot be simply given to you on a silver platter. Right? So how do parents give us our space? When your parents trust you with something, honor that trust. Huh? When your parents, or you tell your parents, I'm going to my cousin, don't go to your lover. Go to your cousin. Huh? I'm being very blunt. Huh? There is no reason to hide behind our pillars. Because if we keep denying the fact that we have a problem with our youth in terms of alcohol, in terms of sex, I'm going to be extremely open tonight then we are not facing realities. And we know that our children are facing and being engrossed in alcohol, illicit drugs, illegal sex, and we are turning a blind eyes. And we are saying Muslim children will never be affected by that because we have an immunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, immunity can only be granted on the basis of self-restraint, on the basis of me holding back from what is haram and practicing what is halal. Right? Only then I will be in a position for my parents to trust me and for my parents to give me that space, right? Because now I'm no longer responsible for my parents. I'm no longer responsible to the society I'm living in. I'm no longer responsible to my peace. I'm no longer responsible to authority. I am only responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we train our kids to be responsible to Allah first and foremost, then the question of trust will fall in place. The question of trust will come a non-issue to our parents and their relationship with their kids. So if our teenagers want that space, 
then earn that space so that when your parents give you that space you don't sleep and when you sleep the first time they will forgive you you sleep the next time they will forgive you you sleep the third time you forgive you you sleep the fourth time you have overstepped your space right whether you are a teenager or you are an adult in that regard because no one is above the law everyone is under the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether parent or child in that regard some people think that religion restricts individual freedom and disallows the fulfillment of some desires whereas in fact the aim of religious teaching is not at all to put an end to logical freedom its aim is only to stop wastage of human energies and assets to prevent their flow into improper and worthless channels for example if religion forbids the use of intoxicants gambling and improper indulgence in sex does so for the safety of the body and the soul of the individual and for the maintenance of social order this moral control is in keeping with the real spirit of freedom for freedom means that a man or a woman should be able to take full advantage of his assets of existence to help in the evolution of the individual and the society at large it does not at all mean squandering of God given energies and indulging in immoderation and libertinism religious support or religion support every kind of freedom that carries man forward towards evolution towards what is best in various fields of his existence only this is what freedom in the real sense means anything else is libertinism that is why religion allows man to use all good things in life to wear any reasonable dress to relish any good food and to take part in any healthy pastime in short it has allowed the use of all comforts and conveniences of life and does not ask anyone to give up on any such things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said what eat and drink but do not squander yani don't go to access Imam Ali when he was asked what is the best balanced way to live in life he quoted that ayah eat and drink but do not squander live a life of balance take as much as you want and don't encroach on other people's personal you know uh, assets or personal wealth or personal dignities or personal honors the Quran also further explains when Allah says who has forbidden the beautiful things of Allah which he has produced for his servants and the pure food that he has made available to them moreover our religion calls upon us to never forget the exigencies and requirements of time and to keep ourselves well informed about the latest developments in medicine technology and industry Imam Sadiq says what he who knows his time and its requirements shall not be taken unaware by the dark events of life don't be indifferent to what's happening to the world today be involved in as far as the political movement of this world the social movement of this world even the fashion movement of this world even the food movement of this world even the evolution movement of this world even the environmental movement of this world because you're a Muslim and you should be aware of all the events of your time you are God's vicegerent on earth what sort of a vicegerent on earth that does not know his own time does not know his own time finally let us see what the Quran says and how he advises us that when we are told something how we should relate to it Allah says give glad tidings to my servant who listen to what is said and follow the best thereof 
they are those whom God has truly guided. الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ Those, when they listen to anything that is being said, they will only take the best out of it and put it into practice. I have gone way over my time. Thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for your patience with me. Thank you for being tolerant of what I said every now and then. Thank you for being also patient with my outcries and my loud voice, that I lost my voice eventually. Thank you for being so accommodating and generous. Thank you for your smiles. Thank you for your du'as. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you for being a brilliant and amazing accommodating community that I have ever had the honor to be their humble servant. Before I leave my podium, I have to mention two things because if I don't, then I would not have done my duty before Allah, whom the Prophet had told us, he who does not see it in himself to thank the creatures, then he cannot see it in himself to thank the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot list everyone I have come across, but I have come across each and every one of you. And each and every one of you, I felt, was either a brother, a sister, or a mother, but not a wife. Okay? <laughs> okay? All of you were amazing human beings. And I respect each and every one of you for your generosity and accommodation. But I have to thank my host, who indeed, and I know he doesn't want me to say this, right? And he doesn't even know that I'm saying this. And he'll probably go and hide somewhere. No, no, don't go, Brother Hassan. Who has been phenomenal, and I say it in all honesty, that I felt that I was the host and he was the guest. That the house I was in, I was at liberty to do anything I want. Although I didn't do anything out of decorum. I think so, right? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so I ask you all with the loudest of salawat to pray for our brother Hassan and to show that and to his family and to his amazing wife who was in the past three days acting like she was my mom. Make sure you take this medicine. Make sure before you sleep you eat this bread. Make sure you eat your rusk because it's good for your stomach. Make sure you take probates. Make sure I said, Mom, I got it. <laughs> and she was phenomenal in going and sending every Tom, Dick and Harry to pick up this food from here or this medicine from here or this. And I don't want to talk about how my horse was extremely accommodating with my shopping sprees. May Allah bless you, Brother Hassan. May Allah bless your families, both from Faiza's side and Hassan's side. And I must also take my hat in respect to a phenomenal member of your committee. For by Allah, I love him like a guru. And I take him as a role model to me personally as a father. And that is no one else other than Jamil Ankum. May Allah bless you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you. May Allah give you more and more to be a shining star of the Koja community in this community to always make our brothers and sisters in this community feel proud that we have people of your caliber and others who are so philanthropic and so giving in this community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor each and every one of you and simply, and I truly say this with the sincerity of my heart, I cannot afford to go to the day of judgment with anyone holding grudges against me. If I have hurt anyone, if I have said anything to anyone that may have caused them to grieve, to bereave, or if I have offended anyone, please come and take your right from me now. Because my visa card does not work. My American Express will not be of benefit to me on the Day of Judgment. The only thing that will work for me is if you forgive me for anything I have offended you with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever make us brothers and forever make us a mirror image of one another. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, you've been too kind. Uh, we'll start with the Q&A. If anybody has any questions, first we'll start with the paper questions. And after that, put the mic.
About discrimination? Yes, yes. Not discrimination with anyone. Yes. Uh, the other day, somebody raised the question about having food from the Hindu and something like that. And you said to refer to the Malaya. Yes. Now, does that mean that uh, you personally think that you can have it from uh, Hindu and or I do. Or not discriminate against the Hindus. Mm. I personally do not discriminate against anyone that Allah has created in this world. My marja of taqlid is of the opinion. And if you want to discuss this matter with me further, you can discuss it in private. But I will tell you my marja of taqlid says that on the basis of Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have honored the son of Adam. And the son of Adam is every human that Allah has created on the face of earth. Based on this ayah, right, he argues that every human being is ritually tahir. As far as his aqidah is concerned, that is between him and his Lord. Allah can judge him in as far as what he thinks the situation is. Those who argue in fairness to those who do taqlid of other respected maraja of taqlid, who don't hold the same opinion, they quote the ayah that says, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najas." The polyest are impure, so they should not exercise the ability to enter into the sacred mosque again. Right? Upon careful examination of this ayah, and I'm not here to give my personal inclination towards the opinion of any marja over another. That is a personal belief system that you have a right to believe in, in accordance to what you think is right on the basis of the marja of taqlid that you do taqlid with. Right? They argue that when that ayah was revealed to the Prophet wasallam, right? The mushrikeen did not leave Mecca. They were still in Mecca. So if that ayah meant that they were ritually, physically impure, then the Prophet should have been without any hesitation in a position to expel all the mushrikeen out of Mecca. But he didn't. Right? So what happened? There was a phasing out of the mushrikeen from Mecca, not on the basis that they are najis, on the fact that they are physically najis or impure, but on the basis that Allah was trying to determine at that crucial time in the life of Muslims, the Muslim state as opposed to a non-Muslim state. So it was a division at that time who was a Muslim and who was not a Muslim. It is not on the basis that their najasa is that that relates to their physical entity. Right? Because that ayah that says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have given every son of Adam an honor. That honor belongs to his physical entity. And that's why this marja or that marja or more than one marja are of the opinion today that people are not ritually najis. Okay? I don't want to go more into that. It is up to the taqlid that you follow to identify what your marja say in that regard. Salam, what is the logic behind the numerical division of Tasbih Fatima Zahra? What is the logical numerical division of the Tasbih? Yani why 34 Allahu Akbar? Why 33 Alhamdulillah? And why 33 Subhanallah? Simply, I don't have a clue. <laughs> huh? I don't have a clue. Why? And you know what? It doesn't concern me to know. Right? If the Prophet ﷺ said to Fatima Zahra when she was asking for someone to come and help her with the household chores, and he said, let me give you something better than the world and what's in it. 
that every after every prayer you sit you and Ali and you do 34 Allahu Akbar 33 Alhamdulillah and 33 Subhanallah the Malaika will not be able to count the reward that is accrued on behalf of that prayer huh? so that is what concerns me in that regard but if the person who is asking you asking me with a very smiling face may Allah bless him because he put a smiling face at the end if you come to an understanding why is it divided in that I will be forever indebted to you to let me know in regard to that issue on Jum'atul Wada we offer four rakat prayers entitled Qaza'i Umri prayer to eradicate life gone qadha prayers Allah what's an easy way to get out of it huh? Huh. it is said that this prayer has the power to eradicate qadha prayers for 700 years and I'm telling you from this member even if my turban is gonna be thrown off my head there is no such prayers okay and those who invented this prayer wants to take the easy way out right don't escape your debts brothers and sisters because imagine if someone you've lent him seven hundred thousand dollars and he says how about if i pay it back with four nak anamaz huh? or how about if i pay my debt back to you with four hundred dollars don't take god for a mockery huh? there is no such thing as this prayer of qaza'i umri because it does not exist and those people who have invented this particular prayer has no corroboration for it from an imam or a prophet salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in salam alaykum salam i think i have seen the prophet and other members of ahlul bayt in my dreams how do i know they are true dreams well, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that shaitan cannot replicate the Prophet in a dream. So if you see the Prophet in a dream, it means you have already seen the Prophet in the dream. Right? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In as far as the Imams are concerned, I believe the same thing applies. If you see the Imams in your dream, it is not that someone else is uh, trying to take their uh, place or to uh, 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 yani emulate their place. Salamu alaikum salam. Can you please elaborate on Ayah Surah Yaseen 8 and 9? Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put yokes around I don't know necks of people and pour walls in front and behind them so they can't be guided no it's not in that regard وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصُرُونَ It does not mean that God literally has placed these walls of misguidance to people so that because Allah does not want to guide them. No. After people have exercised their own willpower not to take guidance as a route to reach to Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says by virtue of them doing so they've already placed these walls in front of them and behind them so that now whatever you tell them they don't hear right how many times have you come across someone when you tell him day and night salah be good give charity he says I don't have to right do I blame Allah for that huh do I blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah did not guide him what is our concept of guidance brothers and sisters i said that from day one if our concept of guidance is along the lines that i wait for allah to bring down a battalion of malaika with ak-47s to put it to my head and say get up and pray otherwise we're gonna finish the whole magazine in your head then this is not guidance right guidance is for allah to give you free will then to send messengers from within and from without and people that come during your lifespan to show you how to be guided and then on the basis of your own free will you decide not to be guided for example imagine if someone comes to me now and he says let's go to the wharf what's the name of the sea area here you have what, what is it sea view sea view someone knocks at your door at five o'clock in the morning and he says, let's go to defense Imam Barga for prayer. 
You look at the clock, it says, at five in the morning? Are you out of your mind? Huh? Don't you have something else to do? Go to bed, man. Okay, that man leaves you, goes to defense Imam Barga to offer his prayer. Five minutes later, another one comes. He says, you know what? I have already packed my, what do you call it? Fishing lines to go to sea view for fishing. It's 5.25 in the morning. And you say, let's chill, mate. Huh? Let's go, mate. What an opportunity. Now you tell me this is from Allah and this is from Shaitan. You made that decision. It is not Allah who told you don't go to defense Imam Barga. You made that decision yourself not to go. And when the other guidance of going to see you came your way, you made that decision. Why? Because one appeals to your desires and the other does not appeal to your desires. So it is you who can curb your desires and go to the Imam Barga. Or it is you who can go with your desires and end up at sea view fishing for pomfret, I don't know what. Right? Then this is your derogative in the matter. Nowadays women seem to be the bread earners. Men have become lazy. It is exhausting for a woman to be able to do both roles, man and woman. Run the household and also earn how to handle this. Prenup. You know what prenup is? Uh, prenup. It's about time the community grows and starts drawing prenups. I know people don't like what I say. I know. But I'm not bringing things from my own closet. I'm not bringing the concept of, ah, prenup is a Western concept. Taib. I want you to go and examine a tafsir of Quran by the name of Tafsir al Ayashi. Okay? Very famous Shia tafsir of the Quran. I don't want to go and dwell into details. Go and see did Imam Ali and Fatima al Zahra draw prenup against one another or not? Okay? In tafsir al Ayashi. And then let's argue the point. Or rather, I don't like the word argue. I would rather use the word di dialogue among one another. Is prenup an Islamic concept or a Western concept? Huh? And we will see how we can preserve the dignity of both men and women if we understand our reciprocative role on the basis of drawing re prenups, not in order to make our life difficult, but in order to bring some sort of synchronization and harmony in our respective roles towards one another. By Allah, it's not going to take the manhood of a man that when he sees his wife toiling around the house and laboring around the house while he's sitting down, bring this and take this. Bring the masala or take the masala. Bring the tea and take the tea. Bring the pakoras and take the pakoras. Bring the chicken tikka and take the chicken tikka while the wife is, lo is, is toiling and laboring in the house. Get up, brother. Because in the eyes of Allah, you will be honored because the wife is your wife and the house is your house. So if you help inside the house, you are helping because it is your house. And if you help your wife, you are helping because she is your wife. It's not going to take anything from you if you stand up and wash your plate. It's not going to take much of you if you iron your shirt. No, this is not, this is below me to some men. Yet the Prophet wasallam was inquired about his behavior at home. How was the Prophet at home wasallam? His wife answered, he used to be in the service of his family until the call for prayer would come. Meaning, what in the service of his family? Yani he's not sitting down and saying, Aisha, I want a glass of water. Hafsa, I feel like some kajur. Um Salama, I feel like some honey. Huh? Um Habiba, I feel like some vinegar. 
Huh? Nine wives the Prophet had, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he was going from one place to another, telling each wife, is there anything you want me to help you with? So much so that his wife's reports, the Prophet used to sit by the door of the house and he will take a needle and thread and he used to mend his shoes and his abaya. And when we used to tell him, Ya Rasulullah, nahnu nakfiq. Ya Rasulullah, we will take over. He says, no, I prefer to do things in my own way. Subhanallah. If a button is missing in my shirt, I see it in my own mindset that it is deserving to humiliate my wife like there is no other day under the sun. For a button that is missing, how much would a button take from you to mend it yourself? To do it yourself when your Prophet used to mend his own shoes. Salawatullahi wa He used to mend his own abaya. He used to fetch water for his wives and his family. He used to sweep the house of Fatima. Salamullahi Once he goes to the house of Fatima and Fatima is grinding wheat and holding Al Hassan and she's about to sweep the floor because the broom was standing next to her. When Amir al muminin and the Prophet arrived at the house, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at Amir al muminin and he said what? MashaAllah, Fatima is a good housewife, mate. Let us chill on some teacher. Would the Prophet do that? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know what he said to Imam Ali? Choose one of the three tasks. Choose one of them. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I will choose to grind the wheat. Fatima said, I will take care of Hassan in one riwayah. And in another riwayah, the Prophet said, then I will sweep the house of Fatima. Huh? This is manhood. Not manhood, someone who sits and gives orders. Huh? Because we have a saying in Arabic, or it is a universal saying. That goes along the lines of what? Sayyidul Qawmi Khadimahum. The master of any community is the one that serves them. If you want to be a master, you want to be a leader, you have to be someone that serves. You cannot be a leader if you do not serve. And especially when you serve within your family, you are serving no one but yourself. Do we become what? Or do we become a worm? food when we die. Why are you concerned about your body? Be concerned about your soul. Who cares what happens to the body? As long as your soul is intact. When your soul leaves your body after the last moment when you are asked, who is your Lord, who is your Prophet, who is your Imam? Who cares about the body, what happens to it after? It decomposes, it rots, it becomes eaten. But you know there is a ibra in that. There is a lesson in that. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, See this body you've been feeding and looking after for 50, 60, 70 years? That's what's going to happen to it. It's going to decompose. Though when you want to invest, invest in something useful. Don't invest in the body. Invest in the soul. Invest in the soul. Dear Mawlana, wa alaykum dear. Can you please share your email address with us? It is forbidden to wear black apart from the days of Arba'in. Well, black in general is not a recommended dress to be worn. Right? It's not a recommended dress to be worn in a general sense, except in the days of mourning for Abi Abdullah al-Hussein salawatullahi wa salamuhu My email address is S-H-E-I-K-H J-E-H-A-D at hotmail.com Please feel free to write it. Please shed some light on why we Shia Muslims do not say the Taraweeh prayers in Ramadan. Please shed some light on the prohibition of verbal abuse that women face at home and the importance of respect that husbands should hold for their wives. I said, no man has the right to abuse his wife and no wife has the right to abuse her husband. Where in the history of our Prophet and the Imams have we ever seen the Prophet abuse his wife? 
or the Imams abuse their wife. What is more do you want to know than the fact that Juda or Jada poisoned Imam al Hassan, huh? his wife? Well, he did not divorce her. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, when he sipped the poison, Jada or Jada was still under the Imam Hassan's marriage contract. He did not even divorce her. Let alone to abuse her. He did not even say a word to her. In reproach, Imam Ali Skila came in front of him. What did the Imam say to him? He said, was I a bad Imam to you? That I deserve to be hit by you the way you hit me. That's all he did. He didn't curse. He didn't say anything. When did Imam Ali ever abuse any of his wives? Salawat Allah. When did any of the Imams abuse their wives? No way. So where are we getting this abuse from? Huh? It is what we need to look introspectively within ourselves to rid ourselves of this habit. Now, shed some light on why we Shia do not say the Taraweeh prayers. Because according to Bukhari, O Muslim, O Ibn Majah, O Tirmidhi, O Tariq al-Zahabi, O Al-Qurtubi, O Al-Sarkhasi, O Ibn Taymiyyah, O Muhammad Ibn Abd al-Wahab. More references do you want? They all agree that the Prophet, according to these scholars of Sunni school of thought, say that the Prophet prayed Taraweeh only once. And then, he came out the next day in the month of Ramadan. And he prayed Salah, which is extra from Maghrib and Isha separately. The Muslims asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you lead the prayer in congregation? He said, so that I will not make it difficult for my nation later on. So that they would think it is an obligation upon them. Just like what's happening today. That even among our Sunni school of thought, that if a Sunni does not pray Taraweeh, he's looked down upon. Right or wrong? Why? Because it has become such a very important prayer in the Sunni school of thought that anyone who does not do it is looked upon in a bad way. And that's exactly what the Prophet did not want. Right? Then, during the time... Okay. Do our Sunni brothers honor and love Abu Bakr or not? Yes. He was the companion of the Prophet and they consider him to be the first Khalifa. Right? I want one source that tells me that Salat al-Taraweeh was prayed during the whole Khilafah of Abu Bakr. Huh? None. Then, during the second half part of the Khilafah of Umar, Right? Also, Taraweeh was not prayed. Until Umar one day came out to the mosque and he saw fit to appoint an Imam so that people will pray out behind him Nafila prayers. The Shia school of thought simply say, if a prophet stops an act, no one else can reintroduce that act unless from permission from the prophet. And we respectfully say that since the Prophet did not reintroduce the act of Taraweeh in Jama'ah, that means we are not obligated to pray it in Jama'ah. However, can we pray it separately? Not under the, yani the naming system of Taraweeh, but to pray as much prayers as you want in the month of Ramadan. It is indeed a very recommended act. To pray as much as you want in the month of Ramadan. I don't know what I've read and what I haven't. Okay, this one. Nowadays women seem to be the, ah, the bread earners. We talked about this. Kindly tell us what is the, signific the significance of saying Allahu Akbar thrice after namaz. Well, our imams and the prophet taught us that when the prayer begins with takbir, it ends with takbir. Okay? And it is recommended, in fact, that when you begin your prayer, you don't say takbir once. But you say it up to what? Seven times. Right? 
Yani when you want to start your prayer out of glorification to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you prepare yourself by saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then the seventh one should be the takbirah of ihram. Yani should be the one that commences your prayer. So that practice is also carried towards the end of the prayer so that there will be synchronization with what you begin your prayer and what you end your prayer with. Tayyip. Can you elaborate on the religious standing of Muharram processions? If the Muharram procession will enhance scientifically, intellectually, academically, the school of Ahlul Bayt, let it be. But if any Muharram procession will raise question mark, and these are not my words. These are not my words. These are the words of Maraja al taqlid That any act in Muharram that make Tawheen to the Madhab. What does Tawheen mean? Yani undermines and questions the madhab and the teachings of Ahlul Bayt should not be practiced in an open way. These are not my words. And I'm willing to discuss the issue with anyone. If an act of procession, and I will tell you one of these things, what, what happened. In India, around the 60s, there was a marja of taqlid in Najaf, by the name of Ayatollah Muhammad Hussein Al Kashif Al Ghata. He was contemporary to Ayatollah Muhsin Al Hakim. Okay? But he was senior to Ayatollah Muhsin Al Hakim. Alright? And he was the most prominent marja of his time. That the Shia Indian Muslims at that time were predominantly under his taqlid. They invited him to go to India. So they took out a procession. They told him, Maulana, all we want you to do is that when the procession comes out, we want you to place your blessed hand on the forehead of Dul Janah. Who said, who's Dul Janah? What Dul Janah are you talking about? They said, ah, we take out a horse during Muharram, which represent Shabih of Dhul Janah. He said, sorry, according to my marja'iyya, this is not allowed. He said, I'm not saying this. All right? Don't go tomorrow on YouTube and Facebook and misquote Sheikh Jihad and say, this is the opinion of Sheikh Jihad. I don't have an opinion when there is an opinion of a marja'a. Let me say it very clear and loud. When there is a marja opinion, I don't have an opinion in the matter. Okay? So he said what? According to my marja, this is not allowed. Do you know what happened to this marja? He received this threat. That if he does not take out to the procession and bless Dul Janah, he will be killed. He was smuggled in the middle of night back to Najaf. I say... If we want to appoint ourselves on top of the marja of taqlid, then don't talk to me about taqlid. Right? Don't talk to me about taqlid. If because I practice a certain ritual, and my marja of taqlid says, be careful that if this particular ritual will undermine the madhab in any way, shape or form, you must preserve the name of the madhab and give it its due respect. Because Imam al-Ridha sallamullah alayhi says, Kunu zaynan lana, wa la takunu shaynan alayna. Be a sign of ornament, and don't be a sign of what? Of misinformation. Because if people look at your practices, and they see something good, they will say, these are Ja'faris. This is from Imam Ja'far. These people will say, these are Ja'faris. And when people are happy at the practices of our followers, this will make Ja'far Sadiq happy.
But when people point the fingers at you and they say, these are the followers of Ahlul Bayt, then we'll disassociate ourselves from your practices. So let us grow a little bit intellectually, brothers. And I'm not saying, or I'm against processions. Don't misunderstand me, but I'm saying, when you want to take a procession out, take it with the intention of educating the masses. Wallah, brothers and sisters, our Sunni school of thought do not know why we do what we do. It is our duty to inform them, to educate them, to tell them in academic way what is the message of Hussein. I feel so bereaved that Gandhi understands Hussein ibn Ali. When he reads about Hussein ibn Ali in the purest form of what constitutes Hussein ibn Ali, and us Muslims among ourselves don't appreciate and understand who Hussein ibn Ali is, salawatullahi wa salam alayh, due to certain practices here and there. You know your community better. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to relay to you what our maraja say in regard to these issues. Assalamu alaikum. Most scholars say that non-Muslims will not go to Jannah. Please comment. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. At face value, we are told that if you do not ascribe to certain standards that we know at hand, yes, from our perspective, you may not enter Jannah. But what is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have no rights over. Right? Number one. Number two. Allah in the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رسول. We will not cause people to hellfire unless and until we send to them what? A messenger. Okay. That messenger, is he the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. Because a messenger here, according to the Arabic terminology and the context of this ayah, means every one that must have and engage in propagating the message of Islam. <laughs> yeah, if someone is sitting in the Amazon who doesn't know Islam, based on this ayah and the justice of Allah, where is he going to go? Jahannam? He's never heard the name Muhammad in his life. Huh? He doesn't know. Huh? Or if the religion reached him in a way that was not clear. Now tell me in America, London, huh? based on Fox News, or CNN, you think Islam is reaching that peop those people in a pure way? In a pure version? You think these academics in this part of the world know anything about the reality of Islam? Unless we educate them and we tell them and we invite them and we dialogue with them and we sit with them and we debate with them and we discuss with them. And if we don't, Allah says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا My advice to all my brothers and sisters, let me be concerned first and find out, am I going to Jannah first? Before I worry about everyone else, whether they are going to Jannah or not. When you read Salawat on the name of Muhammad, you have to read it again because the name of the, because of the name of the Prophet is in Salawat also. So what do you do? So what is that supposed to mean? What is that? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I already mentioned Muhammad. So Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Then Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma Until when? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayu alladheena amanu. Huh? Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayu alladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu. Taslim. Khalas. That's the end of the debate. When the name is mentioned, say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And that's the end of the story. It's not a never-ending story. We're not about a Bollywood movie here or an Indian movie that we have to keep going. It's good to always send salawat on the Prophet And if you can, fine. But let me assure you, there is not a single moment on this earth that passed without someone saying salawat on Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Regarding hijab for men and women, what parts of each should be covered for men and women? 
We don't know until now. <laughs> Allah al Azim, inshallah. Then next Ramadan, I will talk about it. Inshallah. If we miss any prayers, can we read Qaza or we have missed 12? No, you have to read Qaza. If once you miss a prayer, Rasulullah says what? Whenever you miss a prayer, then repeat it whenever you remember it. Okay? Whenever you remember, oh, I missed Fajr, pray it straight away. Okay? Or whatever prayer that you have missed, you should uh, uh, do, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.